Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Christine Williams. And you are listening to Fiber Talk, that twice-weekly podcast for people who make fine art with needle and thread. Still staying highbrow. Mm -hmm. The other one, uh, and our guest this week, from the unbroken thread, with with threaded needle and not one more thing. That's the one I really want to hear about. Kathy Andrews. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Gary. Hi, Christine. Thanks for having me on your show. Glad to have Thanks you. Now, here. yeah, just just for your uh, uh, benefit here, Kathy, uh, making fine art with needle and thread. The alternative is stabbing ground cloth with needles. <laughs> yeah. I don't we've decided, think that's for me. Yeah, we decided it depends on which mood you're in, and so okay, we're going with the beautiful one today. Yeah, good. Yeah, we have a talented, high class embroiderer with us, so we're going to go fine art with needle and thread. Yes. Well, thank you. Which, which then suggests that everyone we've used stabbing ground cloth, is, <laughs> that didn't go well then. <laughs> no, I don't think that's quite the direction you wanted this conversation uh, to take. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> that's the way it goes. <laughs> don't anybody take it personal. Okay, so, Kathy, you, all right, three websites, the Unbroken Thread with Threaded Needle and Not One More Thing, and so we'll explore those. But you just moved to Iowa from Berlin. So That's there's right. a, there's a culture change and a yeah. everything change. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I grew up in Germany until I was five and then was in Iowa in, until long after that, until my mid-40s. And then I moved overseas as an international teacher where I met my second husband, who's British, in Germany. And we taught there together. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Your second husband well, who's British and you met him in Germany. Okay. <laughs> that's right. And we taught there together for three years. And then we went to other countries, including the Middle East and the Far East and other places. And then we ended up back in Berlin in 2007, where we founded a new bilingual school in Berlin and that's where we've been for the last 10 years. And I picked up embroidery when I was there, partly because I needed something else to do outside of teaching. Founding a new school is pretty stressful, as mm-hmm. you can imagine, starting from the bottom and having nothing, including no desks, no waste paper baskets, no oh clocks, my. no nothing. <laughs> and so we start. And so I started embroidering as a sort of as a as a stress release and a hobby and started writing my blog because in Germany people do quilting and cross stitch and they love those very American traditional textile crafts in Germany. They love them. But surface embroidery is not very popular in Germany. And so I started a blog as a way to communicate with other embroiderers and it worked. I have a big online community of people who supported me when I was kind of the only one I knew who was embroidering in my city. I'm sure there are others. I just didn't find them. That always amazes me because we've heard that from other people we've talked to uh, who lived and grew up in Europe. And, I mean, I just always think that, that, you know, old, old techniques like embroidery would just be the dominant approach in Europe. And, you're not the only one that said that it's a pretty rare commodity. It's just baffling to me. Yeah, I think it's it's huge in the United Kingdom, as you know. And I don't think that's just because of the Royal School of Needlework. There is a large body of textile artists who use embroidery to express themselves in the United Kingdom. And it's almost like people who do embroidery cause more people to do embroidery. And in Germany, there just aren't very many surface embroiderers. Now, in France, there are quite a few. And in Italy, there are, of course, and they have some really unique techniques that are specific to different countries. But in terms of the kinds of things that I do, the home for that really is in the United Kingdom. And that's probably why I'm drawn to it, because I like I like historical embroidery. I like cruel work. I like doing mm. silk and gold work. And I like the things that tie into the history with embroidery. That combination is my passion. So, of course, England is, for me, is the right place to do that. And you did get to study at the uh, Royal School then? 
Oh, yes. I oh. did certainly study at the Royal Christ, School. Christine just I turned really green with envy. <laughs> yeah, I well, know. It's on my bucket list. Well, Christine, you know, one of the things that a lot of Americans don't realize, and I was lucky because, as I said, I'm married to an English an Englishman, and I knew that the Royal School of Needlework had what they call satellite schools. So mm-hmm. most Americans think that you have to go to Hampton Court to study, which is great, but it's in London. So right away, your cost goes through the roof because you're paying London hotel prices and London food prices. London's a great city, but if you have to spend two weeks there, it's expensive. But yeah. they have a satellite school up in Durham where Tracy Franklin teaches. They have a satellite school in Bristol where Deb Wilding and Kelly Aldridge teach. And I started in rugby where Nicola Jarvis teaches. And of course, the cost of hotels and food there is considerably less. And the studio is smaller. You'll have far fewer students in your class. And I would highly recommend anybody who wants to study at the RSN and go to the UK to look at those satellite schools because your tuition is going to be the same. Your teaching is going to be absolutely the same standard, but your cost of living for that two week period is a lot lower. And that's something most people don't think about. That's a great idea. And I think it's, it's appealing to be able to do maybe one of the segments at Hampton court and then, you know, do the rest either, you know, at one of the satellites there um, do some of them and at the intense courses here in the States. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. right. But to miss yeah. out on the Hampton court experience, I think you have to do that once I, I, I would like to do, you know? Yeah, it, it is an experience. And the, the studio space there is way up on the top floor in the old grace and favor apartments. And they've done quite a bit of um, refurbishment, but some of it is still pretty raw on purpose because it's where old courtiers used to live. And, and it really is interesting to be up there. Historically, it's interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. So th- that's kind of a fun place to be. And, of course, Hampton Court is absolutely the most beautiful place. You, I could go there every day for the rest of my life and never get bored. It is a beautiful palace. So that was, that was a pretty special experience. And you have the certificate and diploma you completed the certificate and diploma courses what's the difference well i completed the certificate and i started the diploma i haven't finished the diploma in the certificate you do four different techniques most people start with cruel work and that's partly because it's the most i would say it's the most forgiving of all the techniques it's also not exorbitantly expensive to do cruel work. Cruel wool is relatively inexpensive as a thread. And then you do silk shading, which is at Hampton Court and at the Royal School is done using cotton. I naively thought it was done using silks and went out and bought (laughs) silks and got there and they said, no, you need cotton. (laughs) And which actually is, I have a lot of beautiful silk now that I never use, but I'll use it eventually. So you do, you do cruel work, you do silk shading, then you do gold work, and then you can choose between black work and canvas work. And that's how it was when I was there, and I don't think it's changed. And I chose canvas work. And then for your diploma, you have to do the one you didn't choose. So I did canvas. I would do black work for diploma. You do advanced silk shading. You do a choice of white work. So the the diploma is additional techniques that you haven't done in your certificate. And that's really the difference. The diploma probably is a little bit more exacting, but it's really a matter of just more techniques. So that's the big difference. And I chose not to continue with my diploma in big part because although I really love honing my skills and I like the the pickiness, to be frank, of the Royal School tutors, and they're very clear about what is the correct way to do things, what's missing, and this is as it should be because it's an embroidery technique school, but what's missing are the components of design or form mm. or texture. And after a while... I didn't want to reproduce things. I wanted to create 
and produce things, which is why I enrolled in the City and Guilds course with Tracy and Julia up in Durham at Stitch Business because the City and Guilds course offers those artistic components and it really pushes you outside of your comfort zone um, of reproducing things. And it's hard for me. That yeah. I'm not very good at that, but I really like it. I think that's one thing that people find intimidating because what, when you're reproducing something, it's already there. So all you have to do is copy it. But that's design, right. you you have to come up with something, you know, completely de novo out of your head. And there's that fear of, you know, writer's block or, or <laughs> stitcher's block of, yeah. you know, you're going to sit down and I don't know what to do. You know? That's but right. I, 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 I find that intimidating, you know, when I think about the future of, you know, perhaps sitting down and designing things is, you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. And where, Christine, where would you draw your inspiration from if you decided to create a new piece? Right. What, I don't know. Would you do it from nature? Would you do it from, from a poem? Would you do it from an emotion? That's really hard, isn't it? It is. It is. And that's an interesting way to think about it as well, because from nature seems like it would be an easier thing, because, again, it, it almost becomes a stepping stone because you are reproducing something that already exists. Yes. Right. So you are you have a bird. You have to recreate the bird as as you know, as faithfully as you can or not, depending on how you want to do it. You could do it in an abstract way or you could That's do it right. in a, you know, photorealistic way. And then that becomes challenging in, in itself. I mean, there's so many good things on Instagram and, and places like that of people doing silk shaded animals that are just so realistic. They're, yeah. they're just incredible. But I, I like the idea of, you know, doing, creating an emotion, because yeah. that can really be anything. That's right. Can't it? Yeah, that's right. But it, that's that's difficult. And and the thing that I find is when I I've had to do some pieces, and I'm not through my city and guilds course yet. It's massive in terms of the amount of of work that you have to turn out in samples. But I find that when I try to do something that's out of my comfort zone, so out of reproduction, mm -hmm. to something straight from inside of me onto the piece of fabric more often than not, I think, Oh, this is just stupid. And I start to do it. And I think, Oh, this is just ridiculous all the way through. And then I get to the end and think, well, it's really okay. It's not as bad yeah. as I thought. Yeah. And I think that it's very, very difficult, especially as an adult, but for a lot of people to just sort of jump into the deep end and try something. And you're not really sure what it's going to look like. And it's right. especially hard if your time is limited and you think, oh, I've just wasted 10 hours and this is awful. But on the other hand, most artists only produce a tiny percentage of their work for us to see. Most of what they produce is them finding their way to producing that final piece that we all see in the gallery. Yes. And, and that's something I had to get my head around and I'm still not comfortable with. But that's yeah. what this class is pushing me to do. And I like that even though it's hard. One of, one of my favorite uh, sayings that uh, a friend of mine went to art school and, and I use this all the time and it's applies to art, but it applies to so many other things in life is that every person has a thousand bad paintings in them. Yes. Right. So think about it. Yes. Right. And it's, it's always true because you have to, you have to get all those out and you're going to, make a whole bunch of things that are not good, but you're not going to know that things don't work until you do them. That's right. right. That's right. So, yeah. you know, and my son's taking a, a media arts class now and he's doing a lot of photography and it's funny to watch him because he's growing up in the age of digital photography where you can take 4 billion pictures and that's fine, but he's still taking pictures like, like it's the old instamatic photos that you have 24 on a roll um, and you have to parse them out and be very careful. And I, I'm trying to, you know, counsel him that no, 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 take it, take lots and lots and lots of photos because you can take 80 of them and have three be good. And that's fine. Right. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's hard to, it's hard to get to sort of wrap your head around that way of um, creating art, I think. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, go ahead. 
I was going to say one of the things I did really early on, and this was when I was trying to learn and understand how different threads looked and how different threads accepted a particular stitch. I did a sampler called a Spring in Italy sampler, which was taken from some designs on pottery from San Gimignano in Italy. And I did it with, I think I must have used 12 different kinds of thread, four different wools, four different silks, and four different cottons, you know, different brands, different spins, the whole Mm -hmm. bit, because I really didn't understand how different, for example, a strand of Appleton's wool being done, doing up a chain stitch, how different that would look from Renaissance dyeing. And Renaissance dyeing is a much finer lace weight wool than Appleton's, and it's not as fluffy. And so I had in my head, wool is wool, but it's really not. And that's something I think that if you don't do that on your own, you're not really taught that at the yes. at the Royal School, for example. We just mm-hmm. all used Appleton's because that's what you use. And if I did my Royal School piece over again, and I did it in Renaissance dyeing wool or Heathway wool, which I adore, it's my favorite wool, that piece would look radically different. Even if I could exactly match the color, the textures and how the stitches are produced would look radically different. And I think so many people who embroider do things by the book. They, they buy a kit or they take one of my classes or another class and they do what the teacher says. And I think we don't experiment enough. And like, as you say with your son, you have to do thousands of photographs and then you learn what works and what doesn't, what right, you prefer right. and what you don't. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's interesting. Well, I wish your but, son good luck. Uh, yeah, I, and I love the idea of the sampler using all the different um, different fibers because that piece becomes a tremendous resource. Yes. Because as you're going through to design a piece then, um, instead of looking at you know fibers in a, in a bin, you can look at how they show on a canvas or on linen or wh- however you stitch them and feel them and see how they reflect light. And, you know, th- yep. that becomes it almost becomes like um, looking at paint chips in a in a store. You can use that as your reference guide of, OK, this is this is the effect I'm going for. Now I can look at this in different lights and, and see which of these fibers is going to give that to me. I love that idea. Yeah. And I know that people who do canvas work, what we call, what's called needlepoint here in the U.S. and is called canvas work in the U.K., those people very often, if they're, if they buy a painted canvas, will make very particular and, and considered choices for the threads they use. They don't always just buy a certain color of thread to match the color of paint on the canvas and Mm -hmm. work it up they will think, okay, I want this to be shiny, I want this to be matte, I want this to be fluffy. And I think more often than not, people who do needlepoint or canvas work are a bit more experimental in their thread choices than people who do embroidery. People who do embroidery tend to think, okay, I'm going to do wool, silk, or cotton, so I'm going to do Appleton's, Overa Soie, or DMC. And there's zillions of other kinds of threads that we just don't consider. But I think needlepointers do. Yes. Yes. That's interesting. I was thinking about that the other day because I'm kind of switching back and forth between embroidery and needlepoint. And I was thinking about how we we don't use any of these fibers and and why we don't do that and And whether or not there's a good reason. Like, why don't we do that? (laughs) I I think it's just um, it's habit. And is it just that? I, you know, or is it? Yeah. Yeah, because are there some things that fabulous needlepoint threads out there. I mean, some like when I first started, I didn't know anything. And so I ordered care. Is it you say care on impressions, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is a wool silk blend, because I didn't know what I was doing. Literally didn't know. <laughs> I had no teaching. So I thought, oh, I'll do this. And I did a cool work piece using that wool silk blend, a whole piece. And it looked really cool. But somebody might have said, well, that's not cruel work. That's not really wool. That doesn't count. But it was a different look. So I learned something from that. I I think that's an interesting point you make, too, that that we aren't always very experimental in the threads that we choose to use when we do surface embroidery. Yeah. And I I would argue, who cares if if it doesn't count? (laughs) Me too. So the cruel police. 
<laughs> yes, those embroidery police. Yes, the embroidery sometimes. police. Right. So it, if you're going to enter it into a show or something, maybe it won't qualify for one thing or another, and that's fine. But if it makes you happy and it looks nice, you know, I, I think the things that would be showstoppers would be, all right, the thread doesn't go through the fabric or it frays or, you know, things like that. But aside from that, yeah, why, I agree. why not? Yeah, I, I, I think agree. that's kind of kind of a, a neat idea. So this is all this is all going to be terribly intimidating um, or freaking Gary out because we, we just had a whole conversation <laughs> about just the idea of, of stitching not through one layer of fabric, but through silk and muslin underneath. And that itself was groundbreaking. So then the oh. idea of choosing a thread that's not one of the proscribed threads is, is going to be just uh, mind blowing. <laughs> Take a deep breath, Gary. It's okay. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you our, our Wednesday show, we just, we, we went through, basically, I ended up, I ended up in a, a, a therapy session with Christine about my mental approach to these things. Because <laughs> I'm, so. I'm very much of uh, uh, the mind of someone who it has to be perfect out of the gate. I'll, I'll work it till it's absolutely perfect. And, you know, and this whole concept of you have a thousand bad paintings in you uh, is, is just I really struggle with that. And uh, so to, to hear you guys talk about this is, is yeah, it, it's difficult for me to, to comprehend and to work with, but I'm sitting there thinking how much more I would enjoy and how much more I would get out of it if I would force myself to set that quest for perfection aside and just go throw some thread and cloth and see what happens. Yeah. Well, you know, Gary, that's interesting because, of course, when I when you do a royal school course, you're being evaluated at the end. And it is was really important to me to get the highest marks possible. So I would stitch and if it wasn't perfect, take it out, which we at the school, at least where I first studied in rugby, we called it practicing our conservation skills, <laughs> which means something's <laughs> falling apart and you're taking it out. Um, and I would do that. And, of course, I still do that on certain pieces. There are pieces, like the piece I'm working on now, the Trevelyan's Pocket. And I'm, I want to make it as beautiful as I can, so I'm stitching very slowly and being um, very cautious in my stitching. But if I have a piece like that on the go, often I'll also have something else, and not necessarily on a slate frame, maybe just in a hoop that I can mount on the table. I'll have something else on the go that I don't mind if it's not perfect, that I'm pushing myself just to kind of play with needle and thread, literally see what happens. And it, it might turn out nicely and it might be rubbish, but that way I don't fall into the trap of always trying to make everything perfect. And I so get how you feel about that. And part of that is because of the amount of time that it takes you know, stitching is not a fast art. It's not fast. And to produce something that takes hundreds of hours of work and it gets finished and you go, oh, my God, that's awful. I think I'll just throw it in the bin. That's not a very nice feeling. So I totally understand that. And maybe what you might want to do, just as a suggestion, is keep, keep that high standard for your work, but allow yourself to do something else that you know isn't going to turn out necessarily, that you tell yourself okay, this isn't the kind of piece that I hope turns out perfectly. This is a messing around piece and just see what happens. But that's hard. I know. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it is. You know, when I, I was a professional musician and I was a trained oboist and played in an orchestra for 25 years and, you know, you want to play the right note in the right place at the right time with the right dynamic. And that was really important. And then oh, probably when I was in university, I got hired to play with a group called the Paul Winter Consort, and he's sort of a new age jazz guy who was popular a lot longer ago than I'd like to remember. And I remember he doing that job because I had to improvise, and I really never been taught to improvise. I'd been taught to play the right note in the right place. And that so threw me out of my comfort zone. And in those rehearsals on the day of the show, we had all day rehearsals, I just kind of got pushed 
because I had to, or I wouldn't have a paycheck at the end of the day. I got pushed <laughs> into improvising. And in the end, I just thought, well, who cares? Nobody's going to know. I'll just do what I think is right. And it worked out okay. But I had to be pushed because I'd been taught, just like you, to do it perfectly. And that was the goal. So that's a really hard thing to get away from. I totally understand that, Gary. And and as an oboe player, I mean, that's not a simple instrument to play. Boy, you, that's a real, a real leap. Wow. Well, I, Gary, I got to tell you, every instrument is equally simple and difficult. They just have d different difficulties. People say the oboe is difficult, but it's. I think the violin's horrible. I find that much more <laughs> difficult to play well. <laughs> so you know, it just depends. Or the trombone. I play the trombone i know the technique but i wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy for me to play it for them because i really am bad at it so it's just a matter of you know what your affinity is yeah i guess i played trumpet <laughs> I, I played Can trumpet you hear and, the... yeah, yeah. <laughs> see i played trumpet and you you would win people. It's like I don't even know how you keep track of all that. I really don't. So <laughs> yeah, but you have to buzz your lips at different speeds and tighten the corners and loosen the corners to get the different overtone when one valve is down or valve one and three are down, and that's really hard to do. Yeah. So you know, it's just a different difficulty skill level. It's <laughs> I don't think one's harder than the other. So okay, making notes here. Making notes. <laughs> oh, good. Do you still play trumpet, Gary? No, no, no. Gave it up a long time ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I direct direct the handbell choir at church, so I get my music out of that. Um, oh, beautiful sound! Yeah. Oh. That is a gorgeous sound. Yeah, it's um, it's a real treat for me. And uh, now we're recording this, and and the rehearsal is tonight. And I have to say, I really look forward to it. I look forward to to giving that downbeat and hearing that music come out and working, yeah. working parts through. It's so much fun. And yeah, it uh, is. And people say to me, would you rather play or direct? And I just, I'd rather direct every day. Cause it's, it's so much fun to just feel it come together. And when it does and everybody gets a smile on their face, you know, there's just nothing like it. So mm, yeah. yeah, it's a great feeling, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That, that corporate creative act where you're the director or in the handbook choir, where you're in the orchestra, that is really something special that we just don't have as, as textile artists. It, you know, we do our own thing ourselves in a studio somewhere. And even if you're in a studio with 10 other people who are embroidering, you're still only doing your own thing. And I, that is the one thing that I miss, or that is the difference, I would say, between being a musician and being an embroiderer is a musician you can share, just like what you explained, you can share that feeling of contributing to the creation of a bigger whole. And when you embroider, you just don't have that. It's not the same, which is why I like to teach, because that's how I can share that passion and, and get feedback from people about how much they love it. That's about as close as I get to the, the being a musician aspect of yeah. it. Well, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm a former teacher, too, so I... Yeah, I that's where it all plays in. But yeah, we had a couple Sundays ago, we had extremely, extremely difficult piece that was really, I was really stretching them and, and forcing the group to, to, you know, go one more level than they'd ever been. And there was one segment in there that has just always been a rocky mess and we could get through it, but uh, it wasn't right. And, and a couple Sundays ago, they hit it. They hit it in sync oh. and you could just feel everybody. It became music <laughs> And you could feel everybody bounce to the rhythm, and oh, it was just wonderful. And well, uh, congratulations! Yeah. yeah, it was just that moment, and and it was worth everything. It was worth everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a lot of fun that way. Yep. Yeah, got to get more of that. I'm getting some tonight. It's going to be great. <laughs> Good. So this uh, moving to Iowa, you you posted a couple pictures. You moved in, was it your parents' house? Uh, yeah. In Actually, my grandparents built grandparents. this house in uh -huh. 1954. And the kitchen is still the original kitchen. I still have this original um, turquoise or aqua formica and the original aqua oven. <laughs> oh, nice. Mm, yeah, no, not so much. It looks <laughs> cool. 
But that kitchen was designed for a single cook, and my husband and I like to cook together. So that kitchen is going to be remodeled. But the great thing is that the house is, it's sort of like two ranch style houses on top of each other. Each floor has a big, huge living dining room and a kitchen and two bedrooms and a bathroom. The kitchen in the lower level is a little galley kitchen. The kitchen upstairs is a proper big kitchen. But that means that the downstairs living room is my studio. And we have windows all the way across the back overlooking our woods we're on two and a half acre of woods and i've made that i dibs that as my (laughs) as my embroidery studio which will become a classroom um in not very many months i'll start i'll start classes down there we have a little bit of work to do before i want to do that but a little bit of remodeling work downstairs but i feel really really lucky yeah it was that picture that i just stopped and go wow what a treat yeah. that's going to be. Yeah, that's a nice it space. Is. It's awesome. I love it. <laughs> I feel really lucky. And I can easily get in between eight and ten students without anybody feeling crowded. So, you know, around a table with hoops. We couldn't get eight or, well, we probably could get eight tre- uh, trestles and slate frames down there. But I don't have eight trestles, so it doesn't matter. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> it'll be a good teach. I'm fresh out of trestles. I only have one. So it'll be a good teaching space, but we have a little bit of work to do. It needs more lighting. There isn't any overhead lighting. So on a summer day when the trees are full of leaves, it's not going to be bright enough to be comfortable to embroider without a magnifying light. So we're going to get some good lighting in there. And then probably in the autumn, we'll start some classes. And I'm hoping that some of my UK friends will be coming over for classes in the summer next year. So we'll have some people, I hope, who will be visiting to see us, but they'll also be able to offer classes. So keep an eye on the the blog and I'll let people know because that would be really wonderful to have an opportunity to study with those people especially if you live in the Midwest, because it's hard here. If you want to study, you have to go to the coast and that's expensive. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, that's going to, well, I, I had I have to say that the, when I saw that space, I thought, oh, I think I have to make my way to Iowa for a class. Um, oh, great. Yeah. We'd love to have you. That would be fun. Because where, where are you yeah. in Iowa? I'm in Ames, right in the middle. Yeah. So not too bad a drive. I'm, I'm northwest of Chicago, so not too bad a drive for me. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah, you could get here in about six and a half hours. Right. Well, it depends on what traffic is like getting around Chicago, but if you, well, can, I'm, I'm if you the, can avoid that. Yeah, I'm on the northwest side, so I'm, 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 I'm out of town in a hurry. It's okay. <laughs> oh, well, then you'll be good. Yeah. You'll be good. No problem. But just to, yeah. just to do a class in that space would be, uh, would be a real treat because that's beautiful. Well, good. Yep. I'm glad you think so. So watch, watch for it. That'd oh, yeah. Fun. Yeah. Count on it. Yes. All right. <laughs> so talk about slate frames. I was intrigued that it, is that, that your principal stretching device? Yes. Yeah. Um, when I started, I used a hoop, the kind you clamp on a table. You know, you mm-hmm. the hoop has the stock on it and you put it in a in a clamp that you put on the table or you can put it in the seat frame Um, but once I'd studied with Nicola Jarvis was my first teacher at the RSN and she's the one who taught me how to mount fabric on a slate frame and the reason that I use slate frames and I have all different sizes I have little tiny ones that are about 12 inches and ones that are 40 inches so it depends on the piece but the reason I do that is because when, it, when you do work on a slate frame and you tighten the fabric every time you sit down. So like I was working this morning, I'll go back later this afternoon and sit down. And the first thing I will do is tighten the fabric by pulling on the strings where the fabric is bound to the right and left side of the frame. Not the top and the bottom, but the right and left side so that your fabric is always drum tight. And as long as your fabric is drum tight, you can be sure that your stitching won't pucker the fabric and that when you're done and you take the fabric off the slate frame, you almost never need to block it. And I have had no bad luck, but I have had friends who have had very bad luck 
when they take something out of a frame, not a slate frame, but or they've done it in hand, and they go to spray it or steam it, and the thread color runs. Mm. Or the steam iron spits up onto the fabric because they haven't put another piece of toweling or something on top. So for me, the work of putting the fabric on a slate frame first guarantees a good outcome and a lot less work at the end. And that's why I use a slate frame. It, it really makes your stitching look better. And they're not very popular here in the U.S., I think, right now. They're hard to find. That's the, I know. That's the issue. I know. And f- my brother is an amateur woodworker, as is my nephew and was my father. He's now probably not quite so able to maneuver his hands on the wood to do fine work as he was before. But I have tried to get them to produce slate frames, and they're all saying, no, it's not worth the energy which is probably true. It takes a lot of money to set up a shop. Um, I know they're expensive, but they make a huge difference in the quality of your work, a huge difference. But a good second are those hoop frames. And if you, ma- if you bind the hoop frame with the like um, what I would call binding tape so that the, there's fabric around the wood mm-hmm. and, you, and then you put it together properly – you can get the fabric as drum tight as you can in a slate frame. The difficulty is that you may have a ring where the hoop frame is on the fabric. And one of the things that Philippa Turnbull does, she's a big cruel work lady in the UK. I don't know if you know who she is, but she does gorgeous work. She taught us to put a piece of saran wrap on top of the fabric, mounted in the hoop, And then you tear like a plus sign in the saran wrap and open it up. And the saran wrap keeps the hoop from marking the fabric. So that's a good second choice for keeping your fabric taut. That's a clever idea. Uh, Yeah, I always thought it was just the impression of it. But if it's the if it's actually causing. Hmm. Well, sometimes it is just the impression, but your hoop could also be dusty and you might not notice it. Hmm. So, yeah, I've seen people who do this beautiful work and then they have this little gray ring on their fabric, (laughs) which is sort of depressing, isn't it? (laughs) Yes. Yeah, I I just Is that you, Gary? That's not you, is it? No, I no, no, I no, I'm I'm actually overly cautious, I think, about all of that. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I you know, I well, we talked about it many, many months ago. Uh, I took a piece in a needle a needle point piece in, and mm-hmm. it was it had to be blocked. I was embarrassed, and I shouldn't have been. Oh. <laughs> but and it was it was just off by like maybe a quarter of an inch tops, maybe an eighth of an inch, but it had to mm-hmm. be blocked. And uh, so then I redoubled my efforts with everything since then to make sure that not one of them ever has to be blocked again. Uh, it, so yeah, I, I just have these. I have these things that um, uh, I can't, it, when it comes off, I want it to be absolutely square. Uh, yeah, all, the, all those things. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably a little over the top when it comes to that stuff. Yeah. But, uh, no, I, I just well, like, uh, I like when I'm done, I like it to be able to lay there on the table and not have to have anything done to it. And Yep. You know, I well, agree. That's exactly how I feel. <laughs> so now I have to get a yeah. slate frame. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that that's tricky. We had a guy up in Canada, um, Mystic Crafts, and he was making slate frames, but now he's moved back to the UK. Um, is he back in and, business? Was he because th- he was raising money yeah, so he, he could is. get uh, okay? Yeah, he and he raised a lot of money, twice as much as what he needed. But that also means he has twice as many orders to fill. <laughs> I have every confidence in him. I think he'll do it. Um, he he does um, nice frames. I would definitely order a frame that is an oil finish, not a varnish finish. The varnish can be sticky in if in the summer when the wood swells, and sometimes the frames don't go together as uh, smoothly as you would like. But the oiled wood that doesn't make any difference when it gets hot and humid. So those are good. Um, obviously, you can get one from the Royal School of Needlework, but that will cost you two months of groceries. No, not really, but they're very expensive. (laughs) 
And then there's a lady in the UK. She goes by the name of MRS. So it looks like Mrs., but it's actually her initials, but MRS Embroidery. And I'm pretty sure she and her partner, Nick, are going to start making slate frames. So that's that's another idea. Um, but, yeah, the problem is that in the United States, they're very hard to find. So we just need to find a craftsman who wants to do that mm -hmm. here for us. But it, it they are hard to find. They're sort of like gold, I know. So Yeah, Mary Corbett did a review uh, with the, the Mystic guy and yeah. spoke extremely highly of, of the quality of his work. Is that Do you have his, his frames? Is that what you use? Yes. Yeah. No, I don't. I have two of his frames. One of the ones I use is a little 12 inch one, which I really like. Another one just arrived about two days ago, but I haven't used it yet. I'm using an RSN one right now. I also have one produced by Jenny Aiden Christie order in the UK. Who's it's a family thing for her and her father makes the slate frames and it's a little bit smaller. It fits in a regular size suitcase. And then I have some that were made by a guy who's gone out of business, so that's not really germane. Um, but the hard thing, you're right, is that you can find them in the U.K., but you cannot find them in the U.S. anymore. So we really do need to find a craftsman who can start making them and making them for a pretty reasonable amount of money, which Mark right. from Mystic Crafts, his, his are pretty reasonable because the, the thing with the – they don't look like they're very complicated – but the tolerance for getting the sidebars through the top and the bottom bars, that has to be exactly right. And I think that the time to set up the tools and get everything correct must be pretty big. Because I don't think anybody's making a fortune making slate frames. I think I don't understand the work that goes into them. Because none of them are cheap, so they must be pretty complicated to make. But they do make a difference in your stitching if you can find one. So maybe we should put an appeal out. If anyone has someone who's a woodcrafter <laughs> who wants a job, please let us know. <laughs> well, you can't even get your family members to do them for you. <laughs> no. Well, they're all working full time. So, you oh, know, okay. then it's not their job. Yeah. <laughs> so. Please make me one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't need one, but lots of people do. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I have to know. We're going to run out of time. So I have to know. I love the, the site, Not One More Thing. How did oh, that go? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fine. Okay. Fine. Um, yeah, it was started because I felt, well, since for years and years and years, I felt like I, I was more of a consumer than was healthy for my bank account, for my mental state, and for the environment. And so the idea was to become aware of what was motivating me to purchase things that I didn't need, that I wanted, but I didn't need. And it went pretty well. And as you've noticed, I'm not blogging on that site very much anymore because doing that for that year really shifted how I felt about consuming things. I can't say it's entirely down to the blog. Part of it might be aging because I think there's a time in our lives when we're in acquiring mode my daughters are in that mode now because they're in their 30s, early to mid 30s. And, you know, they're trying to build up their houses and buy furniture and they have children and, you know, you need to buy stuff. And then you get to a certain age where you're buying stuff, but you don't need it. And then you get to the next age where you look around and you think, oh, my gosh, I have more stuff than I need and I need to get rid of it. I think I'm kind of at that place now. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's really hard Um for everyone, and we live in such an affluent society, and embroiderers and textile people speak about their stash, and it's nice to have things there, so when you decide to make something, your, your materials are at hand. On the other hand, how much stuff do we really need? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's incumbent upon us not to purchase things that later are going to end up in a landfill. And not to purchase things that we don't need, because the fewer things that human beings purchase, the fewer things that will be produced, and every single thing uses up our resources. And there, it's we have a finite amount of resources. We may not see the end, 
but there is a finite amount. At some point, we'll run out of stuff probably. So I think we have to be really careful about that. And in the United States, that's, that's hard because things here are inexpensive. And we can pretty much, most of us, buy a lot of what we want in addition to what we need. So that's why I started that blog. And it worked. And I got some really great feedback from readers, other people that it struck a chord with. So it was a short period in my life, but it was an important period. It, it shifted my perspective. Well, that was, yeah, that was going to be my next question. So by, by starting on this, you were able to, to uh, shift your whole approach to life then. Yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah, it, hmm. it, it did. And I don't buy stuff unless I have a specific use for it. I used to, when I lived here years ago, this is way, you know, over 20 years ago, I used to go to Target on Sunday and think, oh, this is fun. What's for sale at Target? Oh, that's cute. I'll buy that. Well, let's get real. How much stuff do you need in your house? You don't. But it was a fun thing to do. So the trick is to be aware of why are you going out and buying things? Are you going out and buying things because you want the thing? Or is it entertainment? Or are you lonely and you want to talk to somebody in the shop? Or do you want it because your friends will think it's cool? Or what's your motivation? And a lot of times, all of us buy stuff without thinking. Yes. Yes. Guilty. <laughs> it's human nature. We're consumers. We are. But we have to be consumers who are more thoughtful. Well, between Wednesday and today, <laughs> I'm getting my whole psychology <laughs> turned over here. Is that a go? Oh, is this the calico and silk thing, Gary? Is that still bothering you? Uh, it's, yeah. Uh, uh, it's going to take me weeks to recover. I guarantee you. Well, I have to say, I'm the same. I put calico behind my silk. I never embroider on raw, just plain silk. It's too thin. Won't support the stitches. Yeah. But well, so I, now yeah. I'm really psyched. It's going to be out. fine. It's going to be fine. Right. I'm a mess. I'm just, a, I'm just sitting here in a fetal position, just hoping to get through it. Yep. <laughs> I'm sure you're fine. You know, that, that your question about the Not One More Thing blog, um, one of the things that I struggle with as an embroiderer is how expensive some projects and classes are. And I find it very difficult to ask people and to expect people to pay huge amounts of money for a kit or a course that maybe doesn't have to be that expensive. And I'm not saying that artist time is not valuable. It absolutely is valuable. But I think that there is a strand in the embroidery world. Oh, that was a good pun, wasn't it? <laughs> a, part of, a part of the embroidery world that is specifically aimed at people who have great wealth. And they can travel and go places and purchase things and do have courses that cost thousands of dollars. That's great. That's great for people can, who can afford it. But I really hope that we don't continue as, as a craft to go in that direction because there are thousands and thousands of people who are dying to learn how to embroider and can't afford that kind of money. And I don't think it's right that those people can't find tuition, that they can't find a teacher. And that concerns me because that side of the embroidery world, the really expensive side, is what makes the news in social media. And I am concerned about that because had I only had that as an option, I probably never would have done it. I would have said, oh, I, I'm a teacher. I can't afford that. I'll never learn how to embroider. I'm not rich enough to be an embroiderer. And I don't think that's right. So I hope that as, as a craft, we don't go in that direction, that we can continue to offer high quality education and teaching for a reasonable price so that everybody can have a chance to learn, which is one of the things I think the Embroidery Guild does when they have their open days and they have stitch days. People can come and see what it's about. And maybe then they'll say, oh, this is something I could do that doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. So that's food for thought. 
Well, and, and at some point, you know, how many people have you, have you heard that say, uh, I stay away from painted canvases, I can't afford that? And I, you know, I wonder, you know, you know, we talk many times about how do we get younger people in the hobby? And, yeah. and uh, you know, how much of that is a factor? Is it just sheer, sheer dollars? You know, I, I got to put food on the table or I can buy a uh, painted canvas. No. <laughs> just, That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, and it's not even the, the materials for it. When you try to finish something, just, you know, go, go quote out getting something framed, especially a larger piece. And it's yeah, staggering. Right. Yes, it is. And that, that's not necessarily unfair because, of course, framers can be artists in their own yes, right. Yes, absolutely. But I, I think that, that that's an interesting point that both of you say, going back to the painted canvas um, issue, at the RSN, we don't have painted canvases. We draw the outline on a piece of canvas, and it's our job to figure out what color thread goes where and what stitch. And you have the outline, and your job is to fill that in. So you don't use a painted canvas. So that is an option. It is an option for you to, to draw your own image on the canvas with a fine line marker, and then you choose what stitches and what colors and how is it going to look. So that right away reduces the cost. Now, it means you have to have a little more chutzpah to do that, but <laughs> most of us are clever enough. You know, you could. That's certainly possible. And then the, the mounting and the framing, my least favorite, and all of my teachers will tell you this at the RSN, was to do mounting because we're mm -hmm. all required to mount our own pieces when they're finished. And the most points I lost was on my mounting. <laughs> I lost points on my mounting and it really made me angry because it's physically hard work. <laughs> it hurts your hands to mount, especially canvas work. It's awful to mount it, but I'm really glad I learned how because it saves me money, right. a lot of money because I mount it myself. So maybe Gary, maybe that's a class I should teach yes. mounting, except who would come because it's not fun. I'm in the car. No, I'm in come. the car. <laughs> All right. So there you go. Yeah. You got we can one. Do a mounting class. Yeah. Because but you know, but then the, you look at painted canvas. You know, there's there's its own art form too. You know, why do they right, cost so much? Well, sit down and paint one of those things and see if you don't want to charge for them. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And they, you know, you can't deny the cost of producing something at any point. You know, because there's time and there's materials and there's the the whole creative aspect. You know, the person who paints the canvas doesn't just sort of throw some colors. They do research and they think and they probably mock up multiple different combinations. Okay, what is going to work best? So yeah, that's fair, but it does put people off the cost. But so does if you only do silk on silk, that's also really expensive. Whereas if you do cotton with cotton thread, it's not so expensive. So, you know, we have choices. Why is it called silk shading and they only use cotton? <laughs> Because originally, very funny, Gary, because originally it was done in silk. And at the diploma level, you often use silk. But okay. silk is expensive. Yeah. Yes. It's really do you find, expensive. Do you find that um, technique-wise or effect-wise it's different with cotton? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The sheen will be different. Technique-wise, yeah. no. Technique is exactly the same. I just love silk. I love silk. And... I do things that are little, so a skein of silk will last forever. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so, but I love silk. I don't dislike the cotton, but I like the sheen of the silk. And I like, um, I like wool. Those are my two favorite fibers, I have to say. Silk and wool. They're, they're fun to work with. Now, your, your 2018 classes I have done. Trevelons, is, is that right? No, no, it's Trevelyan. But that's there, thank fair. you. That's okay. That cap and uh, you, you, Bateau Bio. How's that? No. Pas de problem. <laughs> Your French isn't the best, but that's not a problem. What um, French? It's bateau. <laughs> yeah, right. It's called Bateau, Bateau, like a boat, and Bayeux, which is the name of the tapestry. So that's a, that's the boat from the Bayeux tapestry. And the Bayeux tapestry is and embroidered, even though it's called a tapestry, that's a misnomer. It's an embroidered history of when 
William the Conqueror came and overran England, and Harold, who had been king, was killed in the battle, and William, who was Norman, and all of his Norman lords came over and took over England in 1066. That was a huge shift in the political and social history of the United Kingdom, and it was such a huge deal that they made this tapestry, which is 70 meters long, and it is like a cartoon it literally a comic book and it goes scene by scene of what happened and this is just one scene of it so i did that because i've seen the tapestry twice it is extraordinary and i love it and it's fun to produce reproduce that little bit i'm working on another scene from it now and then the cap is taken from a commonplace book which is kind of like a diary sort of that a man named Thomas Trevelyan wrote um, during the era of Queen Elizabeth I. And he also did embroidery patterns in that book. So I've taken the pattern for the cap out of his book, and I've taken the pattern for the pocket, the little purse wallet thing I'm working on, out of his book, because of, this is all tied in with my love of history. So those two classes. And then I also have um, The King's Pineapple, which is a cruel work piece that is inspired by a painting of James the first being presented with the first pineapple ever grown on English soil in a hothouse and a pineapple having a pineapple on your table was kind of like having a Maserati in your driveway. Like only Kings could have them in mm. those days. So I thought that was kind of a cool thing to embroider. So you see, my love of history kind yes. of spills over into my embroidery. Well, and now I have a better understanding of that tapestry. I did not realize it was that big. I mean, people talk about it all the time, but I didn't realize how big it was, but also what it signified in history. That's amazing. No wonder yeah. people get it, excited about it. Oh, it's incredible. And what's re you should go online. There's There's on YouTube, if you type in, animated by a tapestry someone has taken the whole tapestry and animated it to make it move and wow. it, there's no oh <laughs> um, narration i think there's sound effects but it's really cool so you get an idea of what the tapestry is about without reading a book or even an article and it's very effective but the tapestry is Parts of it are beautiful, but parts of it are really gory. I mean, at the end, there are dismembered bodies because of the battle. They show, you know, guys without their heads on. And it was a cataclysmic shift because the Normans brought with them French culture. So everything changed. I mean, the language of England suddenly became French. So it is. it was a huge deal. And it's such a cool story and so cool that somebody embroidered it. They used to think it was the French, and now they're not sure. And they're not really sure who commissioned it. They think it was William's brother, Odo, who was the bishop, but they're not sure. And uh, Hitler tried to get it during the Second World War. They had to hide it from him. It was used around the edge of a wagon in the 17th century. It was buried. It's an extraordinary story that it's even here. It, by all rights, it should be gone. It should have disintegrated, and it didn't. It's an amazing piece of work. If you ever have a chance, go see it. And next year, it will be in the United Kingdom. For the first time, it's going from France to the United Kingdom, ever. So if you want to go, Christine, to the RSN, arrange it so you're there when the Bayeux Tapestry is there, and you can see it because it's yes. amazing. It's really cool. Now, for the cap, did you get to go to the Folger? Because that is one of my favorite places. Yes. Well, I used to live in D.C. for only a ah. few months. And, yeah, and amazing. Just an amazing place. Yeah. It, it is just such a beautiful, beautiful place to be. It is. And we are really lucky to have that resource here mm -hmm. on our soil and to have a copy of his commonplace book in the U.S. That's yes. pretty extraordinary. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I could do tra time travel, I would, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. I wish. <laughs> All right, we got to end it. But that means you got to well, come back. We're not done. Yes, oh, I'd please. love to come back. Yeah, yep. it's been great talking to you, and you're such good listeners. Thank you. 
<laughs> we we both have that ability to shut up and listen. Yes. <laughs> 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 that's always a good trait yep all right kathy thanks so much uh thanks to everybody for listening and christine and i'll be back wednesday